Well, I am so glad to have you with us here at church today. I want to just encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open that up or get your phone out and you can follow along on your phone in John chapter 11. I love the Easter story. I love kind of this this part of Easter. and, And it's really a story that I believe the first original Easter, there was some suspense involved And I don't know about you, but I love suspense. I love uh, movies that are suspenseful. I love shows. You know, they give you those teasers of what's coming up next uh, next episode or maybe next season. They kind of uh, want you to to be looking for and longing for that next episode, that next thing to answer the questions. And that's what that's the question that gets answered at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would he really rise from the dead? Would he be who the Bible says he was and who everybody else said that he was? And so I love the suspense of Easter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, but before I get to that, I want to talk about another story of someone coming back to life, to being alive again, and it's found in John chapter 11, 1 through 3. I'm going to read the first few verses here this morning. There's a man named Lazarus, and this man named Lazarus, it says this, there was a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, Jesus knew Mary and Martha very well. He had been in their home. Uh, They had supported his ministry. They were close friends. They had spent time, a lot of time together. And so if you get a message from Mary and Martha saying the one you love is sick, Jesus would have automatically known that they were talking about Lazarus. And so uh, here's Lazarus. He's, uh, Jesus is about two to three days of, of, of walking distance from where Lazarus is and where he got this message. And so here's what it says in verse number four. It says, when Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. He's talking to his disciples. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus is speaking to them. He's talked to them about suffering. He's talked to them about persecution. He's talked to them about these things before, but he's introducing this idea to some of us and, and really I think to them too that, that suffering and pain can be used for God's glory. This is going to happen for God's glory. Somehow something good is going to come from this situation. So let's go on to verse number five and six. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I don't know about you, but if a close friend or a family member, someone gets sick and you hear that they get sick and and you love them, you would probably drop what you're doing, especially if it's dire or if it's a, uh, you know, someone's getting close to their deathbed or about to die. You would drop everything you could to get to where they are. We would think that that would be Jesus' response. I want to get to where he is because this is my friend. But it says that he stayed there for two more days. He does almost, in my opinion, the exact opposite of what I would expect him to do for a close friend. I don't know about the disciples, what was going on in their mind. I probably would have been thinking... Man, if I need Jesus, I hope he comes when I need him. I hope he doesn't wait around for a couple days. I want him to come when I need him. But he waited there for two more days. Two more days that Mary and Martha had to sit and watch their brother die. They had to sit and mourn his death. Waiting for Jesus, who was their friend, who was the only one who could, who could help him, who could heal him, to come back. Two days they waited and waited and waited, and guess what? He didn't come back. Now, if we kind of fast forward to our lives, we've all felt this before, haven't we? We've needed God to come through in our lives. We've needed a a moment where God could come through and and help us or or to be there to comfort us in time of need. We've, We've all been there before. We can feel this. This is us. But he waited two days. And so the story continues, and Jesus continues to talk to the disciples, and he says, Lazarus is just asleep. I'm going to go and wake him up. And so the disciples, because they're super intelligent guys, they say, oh, good, he's he's just asleep. He's not dead. It's going to be okay. We can get there, and everything will be okay. You know, he'll sleep this off. The fever will break while he's sleeping. And Jesus tells them in verse number 14, he says, so then he told them plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. He's not just sleeping. He's dead. But look what he says in verse number 15. He's talking to his disciples and he says, And for your sake, for the 12 of you, it's for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. 
That doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would Jesus be glad that he wasn't there when one of his friends was dying and while two of his close friends were mourning and while there were other people around gathered mourning this loss. Why would he be glad? Well, he answers the question as the verse goes on. I'm glad I wasn't there for your sake. And then he says, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So they're getting ready to leave. Two days is up and he says, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. I did this so that, those words so that in the Greek, they really come out to mean, let me tell you the reason why. The reason why is so that you would believe. He was deepening the faith. These were his disciples. They were followers of Christ. It wasn't that they didn't have a fellowship with him on a regular basis, but they were, he wanted to deepen their faith. He wanted to show them a new layer of knowing him. And so Lazarus dies he gives them the reason so that they would believe now let's go down to verse number 21 Jesus is on his way back Mary and Martha they may have been rotating turns to go and look every time a messenger came they said oh is Jesus coming have you seen Jesus have have you seen the one who's going to come and help our our brother so for two days they wait and wait and then finally Martha is outside and she sees Jesus and here's what it says in verse 21 Lord Martha said to Jesus if you had been here my brother would not have died I don't know what your thoughts are about that, but it looks like she's blaming Jesus for the death of her brother. We're going to go on and read a little bit more. But really what she's saying in this moment is, it's your fault that he's dead. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where maybe a situation has happened or I've been disappointed in, in different things and we blame God for things. God, if I wouldn't have married that person, if I wouldn't have done that thing, if I wouldn't have made that investment, if I wouldn't have got uh, in a relationship with that person. We have all of these what ifs, and sometimes we blame God for those things. My, my children aren't coming out the way that I, I wanted them to come out and living the life. God, what do I need to do? And life is full of disappointments. We've all felt those disappointments in, in our lives. And so she says, it's your fault. But then it goes on in a few verses. Verse 22, it says this. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, Martha knew him and knew that she was God's son. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. She kind of gave that Sunday school answer. She had heard this before, the resurrection on the last day, that saints would be raised up. But he, he, he says something completely different. And he... Um, he makes a very bold statement here. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Speaking to Martha, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I believe that you're the Son of God. I love Easter, and I love the, uh, what Easter brings and uh, the celebration of Easter. And a lot of you are going to gather with friends and family today. And I love what Easter is, but I think there's something we need to really be very clear about. Easter is less about an event and more about a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. I love what God did on the cross, but he did it. Why? Because of Jesus. And he did because of you and because of me. So... Martha says, I believe that you're the son of God. She believed, even though she didn't even understand. At this point, Lazarus has not been raised from the dead, and she says, I believe. John uh, uh, John 11 keeps on in verse number 33. A few verses down, Mary has said the same thing now that Martha said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus responds this way in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Shortest verse in scripture, Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. See, Jesus is now displaying what we love about Jesus, his empathy and his compassion. He's feeling what these people feel because this is someone who he deeply cares about. And so he says, I feel what you feel. He was crying, he was weeping because his dear friend had died. And once again, another thing that we have all felt in this room, we've felt that loss of something or someone in our lives. 
And some of these people that were there, we have to imagine Mary and Martha had already said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And, and we think in our life, sometimes there's disappointment with God's timing or the way that God does things that is different than the way that maybe we would have planned. And, and we can become disappointed with the way that God works. And I read uh, something earlier this week by Philip Yancey, and here's what it is. He says this. Um, he says, there's only one thing worse than disappointment with God. It's disappointment without God. I don't know about you, but I've, I'm so thankful that I have God in my life. I'm so thankful that God has, has saved me and helped me to be alive again, forgiven my sins, given me a new way of living. But I've been there before, and I tried to do life without God. And many of you in this room have tried to do life without God before, and it hasn't worked very well. And oftentimes we become disappointed with God or the way life has turned out or the way our marriage or family or different things have turned out in our lives. And life is much different when you live it with God or when you choose to live it without God. And I just want to tell you this morning, I want to encourage you this morning, live life with God. Let him support you. Let him walk through life with you. Let him, uh, let him walk the, the days, every day of your life. And what we find out and what they found out is, is they were experiencing pain, disappointment in God. I love what it says in John eleven forty five. It goes on. Jesus goes to the tomb. Jesus goes and he, he, he stands in front of the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus. And so I don't know what everybody else was doing around the tomb, but I'm probably like, you know, I'm getting excited. I'm looking in. Is he really going to come out? What's going to happen? Kind of that suspense moment again. Lazarus comes out of the tomb and he's there wearing his, his grave clothes. Now, I don't know because I don't think it really tells us in the Bible, but what's going through Lazarus' mind right now? I'm thinking, what's been going on the last couple of days? Why am I wearing these clothes? Why is there a tomb behind me? What's going on here? Is this some sort of joke or is this like a, maybe the original Easter was on April Fool's. I don't know. <laughs> this is Lazarus, so maybe his was on, maybe his was. But think of what he was feeling that day. Just the, the everything that was going through Lazarus' mind and the rest of them. Here's what it says in 1145. It says, Therefore, because of this, because of all that had just transpired with Lazarus, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. So once again, I did this so that you would believe to the disciples. Mary, do you believe me? Yes, I believe you're the son of God. Many Jews came and after they saw what Jesus did, they believed. And, and they had all experienced something that we've all experienced before. They all experienced pain and suffering and hurt and disappointment. And here's, here's where we need to understand is that pain and suffering are not, they are not just an exception to the rule. They're part of the story. They're part of your story. They're part of my story. But there's another part of the story that we're going to talk about, and it's victory. Because victory is a part of the story too. It doesn't have to end with pain and suffering or disappointment. It can end in victory. And that's what God has for you and for me Let's read the story of Jesus' resurrection in Matthew chapter 28. If you want to flip over there or uh, get your phone over to Matthew chapter 28. I just want to read the story to you today. It says this, verse number 1. Now, as you're turning there, I want us to kind of just think what's taken place at this point in time is Jesus has been brutally beaten He's had a whip. He, he died a, a vicious death. Whips lashed across his back. His skin torn to shreds. He had a crown of thorn, not just gently placed on his head, and they just, you know, gently put it up there, but they, they pushed it down on his head. There was blood dripping down from his head. And then they laid him on a cross. And I want you to think about this for a few minutes. He's laying on the cross, and they're going to nail his hands to the cross. Now, I'm sure some of you in this room have experienced lots of pain and different things and physical pain, but Jesus knew what was coming. Think about that for a second. He knew that in just a couple seconds there was going to be a nail driven through his hand. He could have called it off if he wanted to, but he didn't. And then his other hand, and a nail went through his other hand and then through his, his feet. He died in the most agonizing way possible. Think of your whole body weight resting on nails in your hands. 
And every time you try to lift up to get a little bit of breath, it just speeds up your dying process. And so that's what's happened to Jesus. Now he's lying in a tomb. And here's what it says in verse number one. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the to-, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow and the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They, they passed out. It says then, uh, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. He gives them a command, go and do this. And so it says, uh, it continues and says, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, as you can imagine. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Like, how just a casual way of greeting them. They're, they're running. They're going to tell the disciples. They've just heard this great message. They're running. It says they're running there. And then Jesus just pops up. He's like, hey, what's going on? Like, just imagine what must have been going through their mind. We see what's going through their mind because it says right away what happened. They came to him. They clasped his feet. They weren't dreaming. They weren't just thinking that this was happening. They actually clasped his feet. They could feel him being raised from the dead. They felt him after he was raised from the dead. They clasped his feet and they worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Go get the disciples. Go get the other followers and and meet me in Galilee. So then we see kind of the, uh, it continues talking about there's a little bit of a bribe going on between the guards and the religious leaders about the body of Jesus and the disciples stealing it. And and it goes on. And here's what it says in uh, verse number 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Remember, Judas had died, so now there's just 11. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There were people other than the disciples there, but I want us to think about that for a second. Jesus had said, I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected from the dead. He predicted it. It happened. They're standing there and they can see him with their own eyes. They, the women were able to clasp his legs. They could have went up and they could, have, they, they could shake his hand. And yet it said that some of them still doubted. <laughs> Is that not a picture of us? How many times has God come through and delivered in your life and done awesome things? answered your prayers you've seen him through and through time and time and time again and then something else comes up and what happens oh, I don't know if God's going to answer this prayer I don't know if God's going to do that thing and our our trust factor is 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 down low but I want to encourage you we know what it's like to be the disciples we, we've we've felt this before too we felt that doubt and disappointment in our lives but it says that they doubted then Jesus came to them and said All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. The Great Commission. He gave them purpose and meaning for their life. Uh, There was recently an article that came out talking about the rise in, in suicide and the suicide rates among teenagers. And how social media plays a huge part in that. But there were two things that stuck out to them and they did their research. And it was that young people and young folks, and it, doesn't, it isn't exclusive just to, to teenagers. Um, there's a lack of purpose and a lack of meaning in their lives. And sometimes we feel that too. What, what am I doing? What, you know, sometimes we get along. We're like, I thought I'd be further along in life than this. I thought my marriage would look different. I thought my family, I thought all these things would look a little bit different. Jesus is giving these disciples, these followers of his, he's giving them purpose and meaning. And God has a purpose and meaning for every one of your lives. I'm married and I have three kids who I deeply love and have lots of friends and church family here. And I I have different things in my life that I'm extremely grateful for. But the point of my life is to live out the purpose and, and, and the meaning that God has for my life. And, and all those other things are great, and I love them, and I'm so thankful for them. 
All that following Jesus does is heighten my awareness of the gifts that he has given me and my wife and my children and my friends here, this church and and the things that I get to do in life. And God has purpose and meaning for every single person in this room. And I know some of us sometimes don't think that God has a plan or a purpose and you're wondering where God is. Maybe you've wandered off or you're just kind of wandering through life. Just as, just as Jesus gave the disciples a mission and a, uh, the great commission, purpose and meaning for their lives, he does for you and for me. The other thing we understand is this, is that our doubts and our disappointments, they oftentimes, they can lead us away from God. And we felt that too. Sometimes we, when God hasn't come through at the time or the way that we wanted him to do, um, we're disappointed in, in him. But God is reminding us and letting us know this morning that They're just part of the story. Your hurt, your pain, your disappointment, they're just part of the story. But the good news is, so is victory. That you and I can have victory. That one day when I die, one day when you die, you can have victory over death. That's what Jesus taught Martha and said, you can have victory over death. If you believe in me, you will live forever. That's a nice message. That's a great message. That's the good news. The good news is, is that We've messed up and we have a God who sent his son to die for us to cover our sins, not his own sins so that we can have victory over death and eternal life with God. I want to read a scripture to you as we prepare to close this morning. It's it's found in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. It's a great verse to underline in your Bible if you have a Bible or highlight on your phone. It says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, This morning, you may be here in this room and you believe there's a God. You believe that God exists. You might have even uh, were singing some of the songs with us this morning. But there's never been that moment in your life that you've said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to become a Christ follower I want to I wanna commit my ways to him. And the Bible tells us right there, it says, if, we're, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And it really involves this word that we, we say around church, the word repentance. It means to turn away from our sin and to turn to God. And so this morning, I want to give everyone the opportunity in just a few moments to, to turn from your sin and to turn to God, to repent, to begin a new life in him. And so we turn away from that sin, and sin, the easiest way that I can explain it is anything that we think, anything that we say, or anything that we do that displeases God. And so if you're in this room and and there's sin in your life this morning, the good news is Jesus wants to forgive you of your sins, and it tells us he throws our sin as far as the east is to the west. But much like the disciples and and Martha and uh, the Jews who became believers, they had to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and that's what you have to believe, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And thirdly, we commit our ways to him. We just say, I want to follow you. I want to be a Christ follower. From this day forward, I want to commit my life to you, and I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. It doesn't mean that life's going to be easy, but what it means is you'll never be alone anymore. It means that you'll follow Jesus, and he'll walk with you every step for the rest of your life. And so in just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to put your faith in Jesus. I'm going to ask Ian to come forward and just kind of play a little um, music for us. And I want you to kind of just think for a couple seconds. I want you to... Let's do a little bit of self-reflection as we prepare to close. And I know many of you got lots going on today. And, um, but I think it's always good when we gather to do a little bit of self-reflection and to see where our heart is today. This morning, I want you to, I want you to kind of, let's just close our eyes and, and bow your heads. Jesus says, if we, and the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of you here need to have your sins forgiven and to be cleansed. Your behaviors, your actions, your attitudes, to be cleansed, your heart to be made right with God. And God wants to give you that opportunity in just a few moments. Maybe you find yourself here, there's disappointment, there's discouragement, there's doubt. You've experienced suffering and pain. Those are part of life. But the other part of life that God wants to give to you and wants to give to me is victory. 
victory over sin, victory over death, so that we can spend eternity with him. And so in just a few moments, everybody's going to keep their heads bowed. Everyone's going to uh, have their eyes closed and their heads bowed. And, and I'm just going to ask you in just a few, few seconds, I'm going to ask you, if you're here and you need to put your faith in Jesus, you need to commit your ways to him. You need to ask him to forgive you. No one's going to be looking around. I'm not going to call you forward or anything. I'm just going to have you stand right where you are in your seat. And you standing is your acknowledgement to say, I want to be a Christ follower. I want to put my, I want to commit my ways to him. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I want my sins forgiven. And then I'm going to pray with you. And then we're all going to stand together as we close. Only you know where your heart is. And all I can tell you is that Jesus loves to forgive people. And he wants to forgive you this morning and give you a new way of living. So I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you are in the seat where you're at. If you say, I want to commit my life to Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. Lord, as we think deeply about our lives, as we examine our hearts, Lord, that Easter would be less about just an event and it would be more about the person of Jesus Christ being raised from the dead and that one day we get to to be raised to life in eternity, God. We thank you so much for what you're gonna do, God. This morning, if you're here, everyone's heads are bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. You need to commit your life to God. I'm gonna count to three and on three, I just want you to stand where you are. You're not gonna have to come up or do anything. I just wanna know who you are so I can be praying for you. One, Jesus loves you so much, so much more than you could ever, ever know. Two, today's your day. It's your day to come home. God's waiting for you with open arms. Three, would you just stand to your feet? If you need Jesus this morning to forgive you, to commit your life to him and follow him, I want you to just stand right in your seat where you are. No one's looking around. Everyone's heads are bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. Just stand right where you are. You're here and you can just you can just feel your heart beating right now in your chest. You know that God has something for you. 